when you look at housing, do you think that the world has changed and that people no longer regard housing as a sure thing investment because we went what we just went through and instead maybe look at it more as say a place to live? Do you think there's been a change in the psychology of that? Uh, Temporarily? Not, not, not sure. This is a very interesting question. Now, the idea, you referred to an idea that housing is a great investment. Right. But I think if you go back in history, 25, 50, 75, 100 years, that was not the conventional wisdom. You stop a man in the street in 1875 or 1950 and say, what do you think? I'm going to buy a bunch of houses and invest in them. I think the usual response the guy would give you is, are you sure about that? I mean, uh, you, there's a lot of maintenance and, right. uh, and they're going to wear out, going to go out of style. Uh, yeah, if you, if you can do a business of renting them out, maybe, but uh, just betting on their price going up, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, so it, it, I think that that was an idea that took hold strangely, particularly during this, the early years of the 21st century. So uh, how do you personally look at housing? Are you a value investor in housing or are you a housing uh, owner to live in? How many houses do you own? Two. Two? One in New Haven and one at, in uh, Stony Creek? Or? Yeah, that's right. It's an, uh, on an island. Yeah. Right. But we bought that uh, not as an investment. No, we just, uh, we just thought it might be fun. So do you, do you think that, do you advise people that if you want to invest, think yeah. about the stock market. If you want to buy a house, buy a house because you want to live in it, or is that too simple? Well, anything like that is too simple, but uh, I think that, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not enthusiastic about random people buying houses as random houses <laughs> as investment. I think it's a business. And you can buy houses and rent them out and make money, but that's something that takes uh, effort and time. It's, it's a serious Still. thing. And again, it's a competitive world. You have to be willing to put in the time and, uh, uh, and stay on top of things. You mentioned inequality, and we've seen an extraordinary period of ever-widening gaps between winners and losers in our society. Yeah. Um, do you have a view about what we should do about that, if anything? I have a proposal. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, I have a solution, but it, it's a Talk proposal. about the proposal. That's what I was looking for. Yeah, and it's based on behavior. We haven't mentioned behavioral uh, finance. Right. It's about human psychology and finance. The idea that I have is we should start preparing for a date, maybe 10 or 20 years in the future, when inequality may be much worse. We don't know yet whether it's much, going to be worse. We should have a contingency plan now. And the, the simple idea I have is raising the taxes on the rich, which sounds like the most horrible, <laughs> politically inexpedient thing right now. But the, the nice thing is that when you can talk to people about risks of the distant future, they are more idealistic and less, uh, more uh, sharing in their attitude. The, 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 the psychologist Yakov Trope uh, has, um, has developed a, um, a, a theory called a temporal construal theory that people really are more idealistic about the future. Mm -hmm. So you want to plan, let's just have a, a contingency plan. So we'd and have a plan, tax increase on rich people yeah, that to, would go into effect if some measure of inequality right. got to a certain point. If billionaires turn into 10 billionaires, we don't let that happen. You have to make well, I have two aspects of the way I like. First of all, if you want to make $10 billion and keep it and spend it on yourself, we won't let you. We'll, we'll take a, a good fraction of it. You'll still be a billionaire, <laughs> so, so what? But the other side of it is, I think we should expand the, um, the charitable deduction. So if you make $10 billion and you want to give 90% of it away, you can give it with your name on it, so it enhances your prestige, but give it away, you should be able to deduct it. The, now, the beauty of this is that there's nothing better to do with $10 billion except give it away anyway. What, what can anyone do with uh, this huge sum of money? So, so it's not and what so about, so the way you would work it is that we, we aggressively, more aggressively redistribute income from the top to for some... the selfish people at the right. top who don't want to give it away. But you can turn yourself into a 
Bill Gates or an Andrew Carnegie. What's wrong with that? I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's okay. So foundation's okay, yachts and, and fine wines not. Well, up to a billion dollars. <laughs> but how much wine? If you drink that much wine, you're going to be dead. <laughs> uh, you can give money to your school and have them name a building after you. And that's great if someone wants to do that. But, uh, but he's, he's still giving it away. Right. And so right. instead of just taxing people, taking it from them and saying, we're just taking the money and you'll go to jail if you don't turn it over, we can find better ways. Hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, are there other things you think we should be using the insights of behavioral finance and behavioral economics to get people to do, maybe exercise more, eat less fatty foods, save more for retirement? Do you think we're going to be in a period of time where we try more of those? Yeah, I think this is the trend. This isn't just, there's a lot of behavioral economics, notably uh, Thaler and Sunstein right. with their book Nudge. Right. So, for example, it appears at this point in history that Americans are not saving enough for, right. for their long, ex, their retirements are going to be a lot longer right. because of improved lifespan. And so we can uh, think of programs that will encourage them to save. Well, it's very, now there are problems with our existing, pro for example, there was a, a revolution in pension funds that started around 1980, where the defined benefit pension plan was largely replaced by the defined contribution or 401k mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. The problem is they didn't require people to sign up for it. Right. And they assumed, well, everyone would because we'll, often they'd subsidize it and right. make it. Uh, but uh, lots of people just never got around to it. And there was a simple change that could be made, which is automatic enrollment. It's still not coercive, coercive because you can always write a letter and say, no, I don't want to enroll, so take me off. Right. But the, the, the difference between automatic enrollment and, and, uh, and uh, waiting for the person to initiate enrollment is, is huge for a lot of people.